All right. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us for tonight's Woo You event with Dr. John Gellis. He's going to discuss supervision, the rise of wavefront guided scleral lenses. <laughs> so I'll be your host tonight. My name is Dr. Ariel Serenzi. So I am super excited to introduce our speaker tonight. Um, he's repping the long hair now instead of his bio. Looks fabulous. <laughs> so Dr. Gellis is the director of the Specialty Contact Lens Division of the Cornea and Laser Eye Institute and the CLEI Center for Keratoconus in New Jersey. He is an assistant clinical professor at Rutgers New Jersey Medical School in the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Science and an adjunct clinical professor at State University of New York College of Optometry, ICO, and NECO. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, Scleral Lens Society, Contact Lens Society of America, British Contact Lens Association, and the International Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control, and a pros clinical fellow. You probably have so many letters after your name. I think we can, we can, we can stop. <laughs> Just go and do well, it. I uh, just wanted to brag on you a little bit. You know, Dr. Gellis has been doing, you know, the wavefront technology before it was ever cool. So he is the person to hear from on this technology. And we are so excited to have him. So thank you for, for sharing your knowledge with us. Here are his financial disclosures, um, all of which have been mitigated. So I'll have you take the floor from here. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Serenzi. That's too too kind too kind so uh let's get into this one tonight uh you know we're going to talk a little bit about supervision kind of where we're going with the uh, wavefront guided scleral lenses we'll even talk a little bit about the history of you know wavefront guided technology and kind of how it's been used previously uh you know why certain things work why certain things didn't and we'll we'll just have some fun with it so uh, some acknowledgments that I want to make, you know, my clinic happens to be a, a very, uh, very amazing place to work. And really without the uh, the three individuals down at the bottom there, uh, Dr. Peter Hirsch, Dr. David Chu, and Dr. Stephen Greenstein, uh, none of this, you know, research or any of the work that I do would be even possible. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Becky Sue, who was our Corning and Contact Lens Fellow, uh, just graduated. She is now a uh, free, roaming free in Canada, <laughs> but hopefully we'll be back in the States soon. Uh, she uh, was the one who really put together a lot of the data that I'm going to present here. Um, and uh, without her, you wouldn't have uh, data to uh, to look at. So <laughs> a lot of thanks to her as well. So um, goals for tonight, what are we going to do? We're going to define aberrations. We're going to talk a little about, about what those are, how we measure them, discuss what a wavefront uh, aberrometer is and how it works and really get into what are the optics about on a current you know standard scleral lens and what are the limitations of those optics and then we're going to discuss wavefront guided optics and why scleral lenses uh help and in, or why we use scleral lenses to act as a carrier for those wavefront guided optics and then we'll kind of talk a little bit about challenges and limitations and then, uh, you know, wrap it up with, here's how I do it. So um, aberrations, let's talk a little bit about these. So, you know, we got to first think about the eye as an optical system instead of, you know, just, okay, well, light focuses into the eye and under the retina. We want to think of all the parts of the eye that come together to make the optics of the total eye, right? So we think about the eye as an optical system, right? You got the front of the cornea, the back of the cornea, the front of the lens, the back of the lens. We got our length of the eye, all of which contributes to the power of the eye, right? Total optics of the eye, right? If we add a contact lens into the system, we lay that on top of the cornea, that just becomes another lens in the optical system of the eye, right? So what we need to understand is that the whole eye is an optical system. And if we add a contact lens, it becomes part of that optical system of the eye. So what are aberrations? Aberrations really describe the spreading of light from a perfect point, right? The best way to understand this is what we call a point spread function. And that's exactly what's on your screen right now. So what we're looking at is a black background with a perfectly defined white spot on it. 
Now, if you have absolutely perfect vision at home, what you're seeing is a perfect white spot on that black background. If your vision is imperfect, what you're going to see is that that spot becomes uh, defocused. So you're going to have spreading of that light. And depending on what sort of optical need you have is going to determine what shape that spreading of the light takes on. So for somebody who has, let's say, myopia or hyperopia, what we're going to see is that that light spreads out in kind of a ball, this defocused ball. If we have astigmatism, we'll get kind of a line. If we get spherical aberration, we'll get a halo, all these various different things. And we can describe these patterns of light by various different polynomials. And we call these the Zernike polynomials. You're probably familiar with seeing this pyramid at some point in your career. And when you look at this, we kind of spread these out into different orders, right? So the more complex uh, uh, you know, aberrations, are what we call higher order aberrations and the lower and easier less complex aberrations are what we call low order aberrations so when we look at this low order aberrations are going to be essentially what we see at the top of the pyramid here so you know our first and second order when we look at those first and second order we're looking at our first order which is tilt and tilt can be corrected with prism but our second order is what we all know, we all correct in our office every single day. This is defocus and astigmatism. Now, defocus is essentially hyperopia or myopia, right? And we can correct that with concave or convex lenses. And then we have cylinder, right? Or astigmatism, which is corrected with cylinder, right? So we look at those and those are the sorts of things that we do daily. And in normalized, this can all be corrected in an individual with a pair of glasses. Now, when we get to higher order aberrations, these are things that really define the quality of vision, right? So when we talk about quality of vision, what do I mean? Well, I mean the clarity of the vision, how sharp the edge is on your, your letter E, right? So when we look at these, this is our kind of our third order and greater. These are the higher order aberrations that we all know and associate with various different types of diseases or various different types of optics on contact lenses, right? So if we look at the third order, the two main things that we're going to see here are going to be coma and trefoil. And this is going to be seen as kind of a comet tail or a streaking coming off of light or a halo around that little speck of light, right? So these are most predominantly seen or rather, uh, excuse me, not a halo, more of a starburst. Uh, coming off of a uh, a point of light. So when we see this, what we're going to see is that these are the types of aberrations that people with keratoconus are going to complain about. They're going to tell you, I see this streaking, I see this star bursting. Some of them will tell you that they see halos around lights. Now, halos come in at a fourth order aberration called spherical aberration. Now, the thing about spherical aberration is this is just like medicine, right? It's giving the right amount of poison, too much poison kills the person, just the right amount cures them, right? So what we're doing with this is if we give somebody the right amount of spherical aberration, we can increase their depth of focus, right? So this is what we're inducing when we're using our multifo multifocal contact lenses or our multifocal IOLs. Uh, basically what we're doing is trying to give them more depth of focus. But if we give them too much spherical aberration, we degrade the quality of their vision too much, and they're just unhappy because the visual quality is poor, okay? Now, these higher order aberrations, third order and above, are not things that are correctable with glasses. So when we look at this, this is really going to be the things that we start to go, okay, well, how do we best correct these higher order aberrations, right? Now. To understand aberrations, we need to be able to map out the vision of somebody, right? We want to objectively understand how an individual is seen so we can understand, you know, are these just typical run-of-the-mill low-order aberrations that are going to correct for the individual, or are we dealing with higher-order aberrations? And that's what a wavefront aberrometer does. It measures the way light focuses into an eye. And we do that by looking through the eye as a full optical system, right? So we're looking at the way total light focuses. 
So the way that this works is we project light into the eye and we look at how that light bounces out of the eye. The light coming out of the eye gets uh, reflected back into the instrument. And what it does is it hits this area of the instrument inside the instrument called a micro lenslet array. And what this does is it breaks each portion of that vision across the pupil into various different focal points onto a CDC or on a CCD sensor, right? And what we're getting then is we're getting these little focus points all over this sensor. So for somebody who has a normal eye, like what we see off to the left here, we see a nice kind of even uh, spreading of those uh, points. You can see that the points are all about the same focus on there. Those points are all about the same distance apart. This is what we see in a normal eye. Now, when we see aberration in a point spread function, what we're or in a uh, on a CCD image on this uh, point image, what we're going to see is that there's deviations from a normal grid pattern, right? You can see some of these spots are much closer together. Some of them are further apart. Some of them are more in focus. Some of them are less in focus, right? So the more displacement of the dots, the more out of focus versus in focus we have, we're going to have more aberrations that are present. Now we can take these, these this kind of source data and turn it into a variety of different things. We can, you know, uh, mimic what an individual would see on a point spread function. We can turn this into color mapping so that we can understand how an individual is seen. So almost think of this like the type of color map that you would see with topography, um, but understand that it is very different in its meaning. This is the whole ocular wavefront, not the curvature of a cornea. So even though we can represent these in color maps and the deviations of focus this way, they're not the same as uh, the curvature uh, maps that you're gonna see on, uh, on topography. The other thing that we can do is we can get a bar graph of the individual polynomials. So you can see down here, we have our trefoil, coma, spherical aberration, all of our higher order aberrations, and we can map those out. Um, with this. Essentially, what you're getting is an analysis of the entire eye as an optical system. Now, the thing about wavefront aberrometry is that it's unable to differentiate the source of aberration. It can't say, hey, this aberration is from, coming from the cornea, or it's coming from the lens, or it's coming from the vitreous, or it's coming from the tear film. All it knows is this is the aberrations of the whole eye. Okay, now we need to understand how the data is presented in this, right? We're all very familiar with diopters of curvature and millimeters of curvature when we're looking at corneal topography, but how is wavefront aberrometry? How do we understand aberrations? And what are aberrations, right? Well, aberrations are a deviation from a plane of focus, right? And we measure these in microns of deviation from a perfect plane. And those can be either in the negative or positive direction. So let's say we had an eye with perfect optics, right? Well, what we're going to see is that the focus is going to be perfectly matched up to that perfect plane. And what we see is that there are zero microns of deviation. It lines up perfectly. But let's say that we have our spherical aberration, like what we were talking about before. What we're going to see here is that portions of this are going to be away from that perfect plane. And some of those portions may touch on the perfect plane, and then it'll deviate away. And what we look at is how many microns in that certain pattern of deviation are present. So what we can see is in this individual, because this is in the positive direction, what we're going to say is that this individual has a certain amount of microns of positive deviation, right? Now, when we look at coma, for instance, this is what we would see in an individual with coma. We'll see that some of it is behind that perfect plane of deviation, or, or so some of it is behind that perfect plane, and some of it is in front of that perfect plane. And again, we measure those microns of deviation and we give it a directional value. If it was inverted, 
it would be a positive. If it was inverted the other way, it's a negative, right? Now, the thing about aberrations is they're defined by the pupil size, right? And when we look at comparing aberrations in an individual over time or an, or an individual to another individual, we need to have a defined pupil size, right? So the typical defined pupil size that people use is six millimeters. But if you don't have a defined pupil size, then the, the data is essentially meaningless, right? Because aberrations can be different based on your pupil size. And we'll go into that in a little bit, but that's why an individual who says, hey, at nighttime, my visual quality is worse. It may be that they have a larger pupil and more aberrations at nighttime than they do during the day. So that plays into this as well. Now, we want to talk a little bit about corneal topography because there is a little bit of a misnomer out there because on corneal topography and corneal tomography even, there are settings that we can use that'll say, show me the corneal wavefront, or excuse me, the corneal aberrations. And there's a difference between corneal aberrations and total ocular aberrations. So what we're doing with corneal tomography and topography is we're mapping the structure of the cornea, right? So we're looking only in topography at the front surface of the cornea. So what we're looking at this is we're projecting light or perfect rings onto the cornea and we're looking at the deviation of shape reflected off of that surface. It's telling us nothing about what's happening beyond the corneal surface, only what's happening on the corneal surface, right? So the more distortion of those rings from perfect rings, the more irregularity we have of the cornea, right? And we can map that out in those color maps that we're used to, to say, okay, these are the curvature deviations on the cornea, right? But this is only an analysis of the anterior surface of the cornea. This has nothing to do with the total optics of the eye, right? It contributes to the total optics, but it's not the same as the total ocular wavefront, okay? And if we put a contact lens on the eye, we take topography over the top of that, what we're looking at is only the curvature or the structure of the front surface of that contact lens on that eye, okay? So you should think of this as corneal topography is giving you structure, whereas total ocular wavefront is giving you the total aberrometry of the eye. So these are two different measurements, but the corneal shape from topography can contribute to the optics, right? Because if we have a perfectly spherical cornea, it gives us much more spherical and consistent optics. But if we have an irregular cornea, we can have a contribution of irregularity to the full optics of the eye, right? Now, let's say we have a normal cornea and we have a high amount of aberrations by using a wavefront aberrometer, right? What we're seeing is then the aberrations are probably coming from somewhere inside of the eye or from the back surface of the cornea, but something that isn't totally contributed to from the front surface of the cornea, right? Conversely, if we use a total aberrometry or a wavefront aberrometer from an individual who, let's say, has keratoconus, if we use just that wavefront aberrometry, we have no idea where that deviation is coming from, whether it's coming from the cornea, the lens, the tear film, the vitreous, or a combination of those, we don't know. So there's a difference from total aberrometry to uh, topography. So topography can only infer what the surface aberrations are and their contribution, but wavefront aberrometry gives you the total aberrations of the eye. So if you happen to have a combined system, right, a system that can do topography and wavefront aberrometry, we can actually localize where those aberrations are coming from. So if we use a corneal topographer, we can say in combination with a wavefront aberrometer, so things like, you know, the NIDEC OPD3 or the eye trace, or you know the upcoming uh, wavedyne, these sorts of things, 
what they are doing is they're looking at the corneal surface and they're subtracting away the total aberrations to say, okay, these deviations are either coming from the surface of the cornea or from the rest of the eye, right? But they can't tell you exactly what structure from the rest of the eye. Now, if you use tomography, there is a tomography system that can do this, and that is the uh, Pentacam Wave AXL. But what it can do is it can look at the front and back surface of the cornea by mapping out the structure of those and subtract that away from the total ocular wavefront and tell you, okay, the aberrations that we're seeing overall are likely not coming all from the cornea. And this, we can localize it to the lens inside of the eye or the vitreous inside of the eye. So we can really get tuned in on the location of it. But a wavefront aberrometer on its own just measures the whole deviation and the topography on its own can only measure the corneal surface. It's only when you combine the technologies that you can kind of differentiate or figure out where those aberrations are exactly coming from. Now, aberrations are variable. They are variable from moment to moment because our pupil size changes and our tear film is going to change and the tonicity of our lens is going to change. But one of the biggest deviations is going to be uh, in the pupil uh, for an individual. So the larger the pupil, the more higher order aberrations that an individual is going to see, because you're now getting to that, uh, that larger area where more light is coming in from different portions of the cornea. And it's uh, as the eccentricity of the cornea changes, it changes the focus of light coming into the eye. Now, when we have an individual who's older, those individuals tend to also have higher, higher order aberrations as well. So to be able to be consistent with our measurements, our pupil size must remain the same. Now, we can artificially change that in the softwares of these aberrometers so that we can get consistent data from eye to eye or from moment to moment so that we can see what an individual's change in their aberrations is under a controlled environment. Now, when we look at a perfect eye, if we have a model eye, we get no higher order aberrations, right? We can see that this individual, their spot diagram, perfect spacing, consistent focus, and that ends up with a perfect simulation off to the side here. Now, if we have a normal cornea, right, we're going to have a little bit of deviation, a little bit of aberrations, but that can correct very, very well when we put glasses on and can, again, give us really good vision. Now, when we go to an individual with severe keratoconus, even if we try to correct that with glasses, we're still getting a lot of deformation and a reduction in the quality of vision for an individual. And with those glasses, again, we can see that it improves the vision a little bit because we're taking care of some of the lower order aberrations, but we still have those higher order aberrations left. So what do we do about this? Well, we use our specialty contact lenses to mask that irregular cornea where the majority of these aberrations are coming from. And this masking allows those aberrations to improve to a certain amount. We can focus the light better into the eye, but it's still not perfect. What we see in these individuals is that they still will have some level of blur present, right? Now, when we go to, you know, methods to try and improve this, there are methods out there that can improve this just on standard lenses, right? And this is where we get into eccentricity and asphericity or Q value of lenses, right? What this is doing, and you've probably heard of this on, you know, a variety of different, you know, soft contact lenses, but this can be done on scleral lenses as well. What we can do is we can adjust the asphericity, which is how much curvature is happening in the periphery of the optics, right? If we have uh, a non-aspheric lens, just a per perfectly spherical lens, what we get is shifting of the focus, right? Those light rays don't all come together at a perfect point. We have some deviation of that point, and that's going to cause some aberration to be there. 
as we increase the asphericity of a lens, we can eliminate some of that peripheral defocus there. And we can use this to our advantage in our scleral lens patients. You can see this here. As we are using a low eccentricity lens on the side, what we've done here is we've taken topography over the contact lens so you can understand the optical shape or the optical profile on the lens. On the low eccentricity side over here, you can see that that lens is pretty flat. And on the high eccentricity lens on the right here, over here, we can see that the lens is pretty steep, right? It changes its shape quite a bit versus the low eccentricity lens, which is pretty consistent all the way across. So what does that do to optics of the eye? Well, we can induce more or less aberrations in an individual so we can either create or reduce more. So if we are trying to reduce aberrations, uh, we can increase the clarity. If we're trying to increase aberrations, what we can do is try to increase the multifocality of an eye and give an individual a deeper range of focus, right? Now, when we look at this individual here, this is a patient with keratoconus who has intacts in both eyes. Now, keep in mind what I'm doing here is all I'm doing is taking the exact same lens. It's the same lens with the same power in it. The only thing that I'm manipulating on it is the eccentricity. So how that lens curves in the periphery. And what you can see is in the aberrometry data, we can see that there's a big difference between a low eccentricity, like what we see on the left, a mid eccentricity, like what we see in the center, and a high eccentricity, like what we see on the right. You can see that our aberrations are the most minimized in this individual with a mid level of eccentricity. Now, what we need to know about this is though eccentricity can be used to manipulate aberrations, it's not fully customized to the patient. This is kind of a, a trial and error process where we may say, okay, let's increase the eccentricity if it's available on a certain lens design. Let's increase the eccentricity to try and improve the optics for the individual. Um, but you know, they typically come in steps. We typically have low eccentricity, mid eccentricity, high eccentricity. We don't have, hey, add point, you know, six, one, two eccentricity to this lens to help this individual out, right? Now, if eccentricity was perfectly lined up on the line of sight, it would be changing just the spherical aberration of an eye. When we use scleral lenses, though, scleral lenses tend to decenter down and out, right? So as a lens is down and out, if we have decentered spherical aberration, what that is, is that's really coma that we're getting. So as we're changing that, that's what we're correcting, right? So in this individual, you'll see that their levels of coma with the mid eccentricity lens are reduced the most. But if we go to the high, the low eccentricity, you can see that we induce more coma. And in the low or the high eccentricity, we induce coma, but in the opposite direction, right? So when we look at this, what we're doing is we're just changing around the coma that's there a little bit but that's because of the decentration of the lens. So without aberrometry, this is unguided. This is just a guess and check with the patient subjectively to say, hey, how does your vision feel? Eh, it feels okay. Oh, okay, good. We'll go with that, right? So when we get to this, we want the reminder here that contact lenses uh, or specialty contact lenses, though they can improve so that there's less higher order aberrations, they're still not going to be perfect with an individual. They're still going to notice some level of residual aberrations and that slight decrease in the visual acuity. So when we look at the standard optics that are available on most lenses, though, we know those purely to correct our low order aberrations, our spherical and our torix, right? Those are the things that we're familiar with. That's what's available on all standard lenses. But this doesn't take care of the complaint that we get from many of these individuals that are wearing scleral lenses, where they go, 
hey, doc, you know, the vision's improved. It's better than it is without the lenses. But, you know, there's still that glare there. There's still that halo, that ghosting. The vision's not crisp. Doc, my, my vision's just garbage. How do I make this better, right? And if this was all that existed, the standard optics and the eccentricity, we'd say, hey, you know, that's kind of the best that we can do. I'm sorry. But that's where wavefront guided optics come in. That's where we can make the vision better. So why don't we get perfect optics with uh, scleral lenses? This has been studied a lot. It's the understanding that there are those residual aberrations, right? And those aberrations can come from two places. Lens decentration is one big one, right? If the lens isn't lined up with the line of sight, we get induction of coma and trefoil. And we also get aberrations coming from internal. As we mask the anterior surface of the cornea, the posterior surface of the cornea now becomes more prominent, right? It becomes a bigger contributor to the optics of the eye. And if our posterior is very severe in its shape, it now has a good contribution to the visual quality in this. So what we do is, excuse me, <laughs> uh, we, we look at the aberration profiles of these eyes. If we're using rigid, we mask that anterior cornea, we reveal that posterior aberration. Now, in some eyes, what you'll find is that when we use a rigid lens on the eye, we actually flip their aberrations. So the next time you put a scleral lens on one of your keratoconus patients, ask them, hey, the flare on your, when you're looking with your glasses on, which direction does that go? Does it go up? Does it go down? Does it go left? Does it go right? They'll tell you what direction that goes. And when you put the scleral lens on them, ask them what direction it's going now. A lot of times what they're going to tell you is the glare that used to go up and to the right now goes down and to the left. It's a lot less, but it now goes in the opposite direction. And that's because of the compensatory uh, aberrations of a cornea. When you have the total cornea being expressed, the aberrations will go one way, but when you add in the rigid lens, you're going to mask that anterior cornea and your aberrations likely flip for that individual. Now, as a pro tip, if you find that that flip happens and you can't correct it with the scleral lens and they're unhappy with the quality of the vision, try a soft lens. A soft lens will drape to the corneal shape a little bit, and that will minimize the aberrations, but keep them generally in the same direction. And when you use those uh, custom soft lenses for keratoconus, as you increase the thickness, you can minimize some of that drapiness and reduce those aberrations to a more tolerable level. So pro tip on that one. Um, now, when we look at traditional optics versus wavefront guided, we can see that the wavefront guided optics are going to give us an improvement. But what does that mean? How does a wavefront guided optic work? Well, it works on the principle of disruptive interference. What we're doing is kind of the same idea as a noise canceling headset. What we're doing is we're taking the sound wave coming in, we're listening to that, we're producing an equal and opposite sound wave. And because the two are disruptively uh, displaced, what happens is they cancel each other out and the uh, hearing, the, the audio, becomes clearer and crisper, right? So it cancels out the distortion that you hear. In wavefront guided optics, it works exactly the same, but with light instead of sound. So what we're doing here is we're putting a lens on an eye, which has these dots on it that we call registration dots. What we're doing is when that lens is on the eye, we're then taking a measurement with the wavefront aberometer, aberometer and we're getting what the total lens plus eye aberrations are. And we take that aberration data and we inverse it. And then we manufacture that into the contact lens surface. And when that new lens is worn, what it does is it cancels out those aberrations that are present and gives us much clearer vision by reducing the total aberrations. So that's how the process works. It's exactly the same as noise canceling headphones, but with light. So this is actually what 
a topography on the front surface of a wavefront guided lens looks like. That's why I showed you all those other topographies of the front surface of the optics on a scleral lens. So you can see these are as irregular as a, a keratoconic cornea, right? It's there creating that irregularity to help cancel out the aberrations and improve the quality of the vision that the individual sees. Now, this is not new. The first patents on this were filed in 2002, right? And the first patents were issued in 2005. There's been the first publications on wavefront guided scleral lenses back in 2013. And they find that wavefronts, or excuse me, that aberrations uh, were reduced anywhere from 43% to 66%. So that correlated to about a one to two line visual acuity improvement. And there's been a lot of publications since on this, mostly from, uh, excuse me, from Jason Marsak's group in uh, at University of Houston and from uh, Gen Young Yoon's group, who was up at Rochester, and now Gen Young has joined the University of Houston. So University of Houston is now the place that is popping with Wavefront. So uh, when we look at this, though, this was great. It was done a lot in the laboratory with great results and in, you know, uh, in, in those, uh, those clinics. Um, the problem was, was that it was difficult to do in clinical practice until 2020, when there became a system that was available that was able to integrate this and do it all in one uh, thing. So this was our early clinical attempts at, uh, at this. We followed the same steps in the research, uh, but we had no integrated lens design and no integrated aberrometry in place. What we did was we had to piece the data together. So we took a lens, we put it on the eye, we tried to measure the decentration of the lens, based on a variety of different methods from, you know, slit lamp measurements to topography measurements. And then we'd take aberrometry out of different aberrometers, and then we'd jailbreak that and then send that data over to the laboratory where we'd try to build these optical profiles. This is actually the same eye with two different instruments, and you can see totally different profiles being created. So it was very time consuming. It was a lot of guess and check. Did it work? Kind of, but really only one of the seven eyes, you know, uh, attempted really worked well this way. Now, in the laboratories, they had all the data, all the instruments, all everything kind of integrated into one system. In clinical practice, we didn't have that. So we stopped pursuing this in early 2019. But then in 2020, an integrated system came about. This allowed us to do automated transfer of the data, measure the lens decentration and rotation automatically. And we were able to get that consistent aberrometry data to create these lenses. Um, and these optics, these wavefront guided optics are fully customized to the individual's aberrations. So unlike eccentricity, where we're just generally changing the shape and going, okay, that's kind of ballpark helping out, this is being customized to take care of an individual's certain amount of coma, their certain amount of trefoil, their certain amount of spherical aberration, all to improve the vision. So uh, the protocol that we use in our office is we use uh, the dispensing of the dot uh, lenses to the patient. So we take their alignment lens with the dots on it. We give that to the patient, they wear that lens. Uh, and typically in my office, it's about a week or so. And then they arrive wearing the lens on eye for a minimum of about three hours. So we know that lens is stable in place. We do our over refraction, we dark adapt the individual in a windowless room so that we have uh, no light in the room, except for what's being illuminated from the instrument itself, right? And we dark adapt the individual so that we get the largest natural pupil. And then we take our measurements and then we send them off. Now, the traditional way to do this uh, is uh, in the literature was to take the lens off, dilate the patient, go ahead, put their lens back on, wait for the lens to settle a little bit, and then take your, your, uh, your, uh, your measurements. Now, you know, the questions on this always come up, you know, our data that I'm going to present to you tonight was done doing our protocol there with no dilation. Um, but the typical protocol is what I just mentioned. 
you know, the question is, is does dilation, you know, is it the best method? Well, certainly it's going to provide the largest pupil possible. Um, but you might lose some of that natural lens tone because of eyes that do have a little bit of accommodation that's there at any given time, right? Um, which topical really works the best? Do we want somebody to be fully cycloplegic? Is fennel going to work the best? Is just trapicamide alone? Does it make sense to use everything? Uh, and then how long does it actually take a lens to settle on the eye to, so that we you know, have a lens in position to its best position that we know about, right? If we take a lens off and then we put it back onto the eye, how long does that take? How long should we let an individual uh, sit there and settle for? Well, those are some unknowns, but I'm going to show you some results here. I'm going to give you some cases and then I'm going to give you the overall and then we'll talk limitations and we'll wrap it up. So this was one of the uh, case studies that we published. This was a cardiothoracic surgery fellow. Um, this individual was having difficulty with fine surgical detail. Um, uncorrected though, for their level of keratoconus, they're actually not all that bad. They're 20, 30 uncorrected, right? We're looking at this going, eh, it's not so bad. So we go, okay, well, we're gonna try and optimize this for the individual. So we put traditional scleral lenses on. And what we see is that that individual is still 20, 30. And they go, doc, this is not helping. Uh, you know, I really need better vision than this. Uh, I'd rather be without the lenses than with the lenses, right? So what we can see is in the wavefront aberrometry here, those maps off to the left and in the grids here are the bar graphs off to the right. The red indicates his uh, traditional scleral lens and the A and D scans over here indicate the uh, the map of what his aberrations are like. Well, we do the wavefront guided lenses, like what you can see in B and E here, and you can see how much smoother the aberrometry profile is. And when we measure out those aberrations in the bar graph, these ones are represented by the blue bars. And you can see that we've reduced the aberrations tremendously for this individual. We reduced them about two thirds of the amount and that correlated to about a two line visual acuity improvement for the individual. So we saw them go from 2030 to 2020, and he reported that his ability to perform in the OR had improved dramatically. He felt much more confident as a surgeon. So when we look at this, this is improving the quality of life for these individuals. This is another keratoconus uh, case. You can see this individual has more severe keratoconus on the right eye than on the left eye. And what we can see here is again, this individual on his right eye improved from 2030 to 2020 and on the left eye from 2025 to 2020. But what you can see is on the more severe eye, this individual reduced the aberrations, that halo flare and glare that he was seeing by about 50%. And on the, uh, the left eye, the more mild eye, they improved uh, about... Uh, about 40% on this. And you can see on the maps here that the uh, aberration profile is much more homogenous for this individual. With both eyes together, they're 2020 plus and very happy with the vision, much improved. Now let's look, you know, we talk a lot about with this, you know, and a lot of the publications have been on the use of wavefront guided in keratoconus. But what about other conditions? This is a patient with irregular stigmatism in the right eye after a herpes keratitis. What we can see is in this eye with glasses, he corrects a 20-20 minus in the right eye, 20-20 in the left eye, but he's telling me the streaking is driving him crazy. So I fit him in scleral lens, a uh, uh, scleral lens on that right eye because he goes, oh, I heard this is the latest and greatest. We had tried different soft lenses. None of them really helped. I put the scleral lenses on him and he goes, I don't see a difference. It might even be worse, right? Not great. So what we can see here is on his eyes, these are the scleral lenses. He wanted to wear a scleral lens in both eyes uh, because he was telling me, hey, my vision uh, you know, or my comfort level on this eye uh, is different than when I wear it, uh, or excuse me, is different from the other eye because I'm not wearing a lens on this eye. I'd like to try scleral lenses on both eyes, right? 
So what we can see is that his aberration profiles, you can see the, uh, the differences here uh, on the eyes. And what we can see is on his, uh, his post, his irregular astigmatism eye, we reduce his aberrations by about a half. But the other thing that we can see is on his non-irregular uh, uh, cornea eye, we can see that we still reduce his aberrations even a little bit here, about, you know, 30% or so. So he went on both eyes from being about 2020 to 2015 plus. And what we can see in a really good demonstration here is how much improved his point spread function is. You can see this is his right eye with the irregular stigmatism. And you can see how we went from this big spread or glare down to this nice point of focus. And even on his left eye with that normal eye, we were able to improve that point focus in well. With both eyes together, he was 2010. And he tells me this is the best he's ever seen. Now, funny thing about this is later on, he did stop wearing his scleral lenses because he said, gosh, putting these on and off is such a pain in the butt. So, you know, even though the vision can be tremendous, we can still have people drop out of scleral lenses just because of the handling stuff. That unfortunately doesn't go away, but he still wears them occasionally when he needs really crisp vision. So just a little tidbit there. This is another individual that does well in this. This is your status post LASIK. This individual comes in uncorrected 2015 in both eyes. And you can see that he has a well-centered ablation. Uh, his ablation was done years ago, so it is a little smaller, but he's doing pretty good. But he is telling me the glare and halos at nighttime are so bad, I can't drive, right? So, oh, bummer. Uh, well, what you're going to see here in the comparison is this is without the, the scleral lenses and with standard scleral lenses. And you can see the profiles are actually not different uh, much at all. And he is complaining with me. He's 2015 in those lenses too. And he tells me, this isn't any better. Why did you talk me into this? And I'm going, oh no, this is a disaster in the making. This guy's going to be very upset. Well, we do the wavefront uh, guided optics on this, and you can see this tremendous difference that he has. He reduces by about 70% on one eye and about 75% on the other eye. And you can see his main aberration, what you can see in the blue, is that spherical aberration that we were seeing on the other page. And you can see when we compare his base lens to his current lens, you can see how much more homogenous those profiles are He's still 2015 with the lenses, but he tells me this. Thank you so much. This is so much better. But then he follows it up with asking me, is there a surgery that could do this too? So, you know, you can improve the visual quality for these individuals, but they'll always have some angle that they're asking you about. This is another one. This one is really heart-wrenching. This is a patient who has had bilateral uh, grafts, and you can see on the left eye, uh, this left eye, unfortunately, they had an intraoperative choroidal hemorrhage uh, and are now uh, uh, light perception in that left eye. But in that right eye, they still have functional vision. They're corrected with a scleral lens. But their question is, is there anything to make the vision better at night? He is concerned about his nighttime driving, his ability to function. Uh, when we do this with his traditional lens, he's about 20-25. We do the wavefront guided, he improves about 40%, but he gets about two lines of vision out of this. So he's doing way, way better and improved overall. What he tells me after this, I feel safer driving at night. So a big improvement there. Our next one that we'll get into, if we have a little bit of time here, is uh, an area when you're, you're feeling like it, you can pop on, we'll start some Q&A. But presbyopia is our next portion of this. This is a keratoconus patient with presbyopia. We correct them with standard scleral lenses and with wavefront guided scleral lenses. And they're telling us that we are struggling at near with both of these, right? So what you can see here is what we do to correct this individual and give them more of their near back is we add back in some spherical aberrations to improve the quality of the vision. So what you can see here 
is that on the left is the traditional scleral lens. And you can see the quality of vision through the point spread function. In the central, you can see what happens with the wavefront guided optics. We tighten up that uh, point spread function quite a bit to improve it. And then on the left image, or on the right image, rightmost images, we add back in just the right amount of spherical aberration to give this individual the range of focus that they want so that they can improve their vision. So what you can see here is with the traditional lens, though they're 2020 at distance with both eyes, they're 2025 at near. With the wavefront guided, we improve the distance to 2015 plus, but at near we're 2025. But with the wavefront guided EDOF lens, we're adding in back just the right amount of spherical aberration so we can keep the 2015 at distance, but get 2020 at near. And the cool thing is, is if we look at the amount of higher order aberrations, you can see that with the wavefront guided EDOF, we're still better than what they have with their traditional scleral lens on the right eye and about the same on the left eye. So we can improve the quality of the vision and uh, give them that, uh, that uh, depth of focus that they're looking for. Now, the other question is, is can we use this on normal? So this is a patient with just, you know, myopic astigmatism and presbyopia. So this individual has struggled with a soft multifocal. Things have only been so-so. So what we did was we fit them with scleral lenses. And you can see this is an individual with their base lens versus their higher order aberration correcting lens. And with their base lens, or excuse me, with their higher order aberration correcting scleral lens, we're only able to get them to uh, you know, 2020 at distance and 2040 at near. But when we add in that EDOF, that wavefront guided EDOF lens, we're able to get 2020 at distance and 2020 at near. You can see that we add in this perfect amount of spherical aberration and that improves their vision at near. And when we look at this uh, by taking a topography over the, uh, the lens, you can see there are our, our uh, EDOF optics are perfectly aligned to the line of sight right in the middle of the pupil there. So they do very, very well. Now let's talk about overall results. So retrospectively, we presented this at GSLS in 2021, where we looked at about 30 eyes, and we saw that there was about a line and a half of visual acuity improvement and about a 55% reduction of the glare that an individual sees. We also looked at neural adaption, excuse me, in a cohort of these individuals where we dispensed the lens and then we followed up with them four weeks after. What we found was that three of the 11 eyes at dispense showed no visual acuity improvement, but at four weeks of follow-up, all three of those eyes gained another line. So what we learned from this was that an individual's brain starts to use the optics that they're getting. So even though they may show an improvement in visual acuity at the dispense, they may not show an improvement in vision. So what we look at is these individuals need a little bit of time to adjust to those optics to start improving it. We also looked at the improvements in intacts and we found again about one line of improvement, about 55% of reduction in their aberrations. We looked at this in individuals who went through post transplant. Again, about one line of improvement, 55% of reduction. We looked at a very large cohort recently, about 110 eyes, variety of different conditions here, but predominantly KC. And we saw again about one line of visual acuity improvement and about 50% uh, improvement in HOA. What we saw here that was interesting though, was that there was a certain percentage of individuals that didn't get another line of visual acuity, but we looked at the overall cohort and we saw that 95% of individuals were improving in their optics. So what's the deal there, right? Why are we seeing this improvement in a lot of eyes, but not uh, you know, an improve or but we're seeing, uh, you know, not a corresponding improvement in visual acuity. Well, the reason that we're seeing this is because we're trying to evaluate this based on what they can read on a chart. So is reading a chart the best method for evaluating the visual quality? 
Probably not. You know, the the objective measurement of their aberrations is probably a much more uh, accurate depiction of how they're seen, but also relying on their subjective uh, outcomes here. So one of the things that we looked at was in a prospective. Uh, we looked at 23 eyes so far on this. Again, we're seeing about one line of visual acuity improvement, maximum of four lines, uh, and about a 51% uh, reduction of aberrations. But what we asked was patient subjective preference. Which lens did you prefer? The higher order aberration correcting lens or the traditional lens? All of the patients except for one preferred the wavefront guided lens. So challenges that we can run into. If we have lenses that are decentered, like what we see here, here is the optic zone of the lens. Here's the pupil. What we'll have is a deviation in the, uh, the measurements that we get here. So you can see that deviation here. Again, if we have things like intacts within the pupil, right, we can see those intacts in the uh, spot diagram. So that's going to limit our measurements. Another thing is if we have scarring in the cornea, that's going to, again, limit our measurements. And we need to assess our media clarity, whether that scarring is coming from the cornea or a cataract inside of the eye. Now, having a, uh, a media change is not necessarily going to say that this individual is not a candidate. People with scarring can still improve. They just don't improve to the levels that we see with patients without corneal scarring. Um, we can use corneal densitometry as well to measure uh, levels of, uh, of uh, aberration. Now, optical scatter is what we see when we see opacity. So in an individual who has no opacity there, we're going to get nice focuses on those points of light that are seen on the spot diagrams versus a lot of scatter or spreading on individuals who have you know, uh, corneal scarring or other sorts of uh, cataract or things like that. So, you know, it's a balance of, you know, having, uh, you know, the, the right amount of scarring uh, or a cataract present that's going to dictate that. The other thing is an unstable lens. If we have a lens that's out of position, we will have a change to the visual quality. So this is an individual where you can see this lens is only rotated about 15 degrees. And you can see that this has had a dramatic change on the aberration profile that's present. So this patient is going to experience a difference in vision. Um, that's where it becomes very important that you're fitting these lenses as stably as possible using either you know, quadrant specific or toric optic or haptics or using you know, free form uh, lenses as well to help stabilize this. Now, if we're getting unstable vision, what we can do is then do eccentricity uh, changes instead to help, um, you know, uh, to help correct the this vision, uh, because it's going to be a best average for that individual. Whereas having a, a wavefront guided optic out of position is going to cause, um, uh, you know, more deviation. So kind of think of the wavefront guided optic being like a, uh, you know, a, uh, a, a toric uh, correction on a soft contact lens. If it's 15 degrees out of position, the vision is going to be garbage. But if you do a average, you know, uh, a spherical equivalent for that eye, you're going to get an okay uh, improvement, but it's going to be more consistent. That's sort of the same idea here. Wavefront guided is going to be, you know, needing consistency, whereas spherical uh, or uh, eccentricity is going to be more like spherical aberration. So I'm just going to get into the key conclusions here, which is you need to define success prior to proceeding. You need to tell your patient this is going to reduce glare or halo. It is not going to give you perfect vision. It's going to improve the quality of your vision. You need to discuss the limitations, patients who have dry eye because tear film is going to interact with aberrations. Scarring will do this. Cataracts will do this. Fit is paramount to success. You need a very stable lens to be successful. And then you need to give it time. If you put the lenses on in office, and this is the first time that they've, wear, they've worn the lenses, they may tell you, ah, eh, the vision's not that much better. Give them time. They will adapt to it, and they will tell you later on, hey, this vision is pretty good. And if you make them compare the standard optics to the wavefront guided, they'll all tell you, hey, that's better. 
So with that, let's go ahead and get to some uh, Q&A and uh, go from there. 